Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. And joining me to jam about MLB betting is senior industry analyst for Covers.com, Jason Logan. You can follow him on Twitter, at CoversJLo. Jason, great to have you back on the show. I know, it feels good. I feel like we, we shouldn't, fingers crossed, we're not jinxing our baseball season here, right? We're, what, two days out? Two days out from there, so. I am so excited. I have my first of two <laughs> fantasy drafts tonight. Uh, we've got baseball on the horizon on Thursday. We can see sports all over the place. And what we wanted to do on this episode is help get everybody ready for this MLB season. And I think one of the things that I've noticed, even with my own consumption, in sports betting patterns is I've been jonesing to bet on anything from UFC <laughs> to golf. So logically we're all going to start betting on baseball next because it's on and we want to take advantage of those opportunities. But one thing we always talk about on this show is we want to make sure you're an informed better. So you're just not throwing cash away that you understand the process of how to bet on MLB. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And let's start with this. Some of the changes that happened this year and how it might affect the betting side of things. So one, there's a designated hitter in the National League. Why mm -hmm. is this of note? Because one, there's going to be more runs scored. Uh, two, the starting pitching is likely to get knocked around a little bit more. Um, in extra innings, we've got a player on second. Why does that matter? I have to believe that's going to favor overs or at least give a slight edge to that. And then the last one, which I recently saw, was you no longer need a listed pitcher in order for the bet to uh, be completed. So, for example, traditionally, if it said Justin Verlander's pitching for the Astros, he must start in order for the bet to uh, get action. But that is no longer the case. I'm curious if any of those things are really going to have a huge impact for you. Um, for me, I mean, the, the, the DH in the NL is going to be one that definitely you want to keep your eye on. I mean, you're, you're putting a – instead of having a pitcher up there basically, you know, laying down a bunt or just, you know, whiffing away, you're going to have a pretty good bat there. And I think the way that odds makers are, are somewhat treating it, they're looking at a bit of an uptick when it comes to totals in those NL games. And But that, that's an opportunity where you can see and maybe there's a surge in NL scoring and you want to jump on that right away because, um, you know, the odds makers are going to be quick to adjust off those kind of things. So I think – the thing, the thing to look at is, you know, look at these unique situations and then anytime that you do see an opportunity on them, you've got to jump right away because these are going to be super, super sharp markets. Everyone's waiting to bet baseball. Um, you know, they're going to be all over them. So you've got to try to capitalize on those sort of things. As far as the, uh, the runner, as a runner on second in extra innings, I mean, you can't, you can't place a bet thinking that the game is going to go into extra innings. So I think for any pregame wagers, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll be interested to see how the books handle the live odds. Uh, jumping into live totals when games go to extra innings, knowing that there's going to be a guy on second if they, you know, they really, really tick it up, or maybe they, maybe they just don't want anything to do with it. And they don't offer any live betting markets, and that's you know, book by book. I think you're going to see some different things. So, Jason, one of the things with the designated hitter is, of course, Vegas knows that there's going to be more runs in the National League. We, as the betting public, we know that there's going to be more runs in the National League. And is there an opportunity where we, the betting public, might be overestimating the amount of runs because there's not like going to be a three run variance from what we think based on what it was. So is it really going to matter in the grand scheme of things? Um, I mean, like all things in sports betting, uh, the universe tends to balance itself out. So if there is a sudden uptick in overs, books are going to adjust. And I think that's the way that they're going to treat this right now. And instead of having a game, say at seven or, or eight, it could be at seven and a half, eight and a half. But I don't think they're going to automatically tick it up by one run knowing that, oh, they've got this designated hitter there. Um, you know, take a good look at those lineups, see who is stepping in to hit for the pitchers. And if it is someone that is worthy of, of maybe a, a bit of a lean towards the over or an extra half run. But um, like I said, the books are going to, they're really, you know, they love that wait and see approach. We'll wait and see. And uh, they're, they're very quick to move on, on any major trends that are going to pop up. All right, let's get to some MLB best betting practices. So traditionally, you're looking at betting a run line, a money line, the over-under, or the first five-inning line. So let's start with the run line. Can you give a, a quick explanation of what it is, and do you like betting the run line? Yeah, well, the, the run line is simply baseball's version of the point spread. 
Uh, bulk of the time, which within Major League Baseball, you're going to see a, a one and a half for the run line. So that the team that is favored to win the game, they're going to be minus one and a half. The team that is the underdog for that game, they're going to be plus one and a half. So essentially you're giving them that extra one and a half runs or, or handicapping them that extra one and a half run. The main thing you have to realize, though, is with run lines, teams that are priced as the favorite, when you look at the big or, or the juice, the cost of making that bet associated with them, Generally, they're not priced like a favorite. So you're not going to, you know, you're not getting a, a minus one and a half at, you know, minus 200. Usually see then seeing that minus one and a half, that handicap coming back at plus money. And then when you're taking the underdog, you're actually laying more juice or laying more big because you're getting that extra uh, one and a half runs. So when you, when you dabble in the, in the run lines, you definitely want to make sure you understand that, that while you're getting kind of an underdog at plus one and a half you're paying favorite prices or you're paying that extra juice for that extra one and a half runs um and people can kind of get get in trouble with that because when they'll look at say like baseball trends they'll dive into it and be like oh this team is you know this team is seven and two uh against the run line this year but were they a big were they an underdog in that were they a favorite in that and then what were the prices accordingly right because you could have you could have a, a team you know have a, a sterling record against the run line but if uh if they were an underdog in a lot of those games a plus one and a half underdog you were paying extra for those so the return is definitely not as high so if we're going to look at run line versus money line do you have mm. a preference or does it matter on sort of what side you're looking on so for example if we think traditionally the dodgers with clayton kershaw there's a mm. team where their money line is going to be minus 200 plus so yeah you're going to say, all right, well, maybe we'll take the run line on the Dodgers to make this a little bit more palatable there. So is it really a, you would want to be on the dogs on the money line in the favorites on the run line? Um, I, I guess it's, I guess it's your betting preference and kind of your threshold. Like how much, how much are you willing to lay on the money line? I think and that all depends on, on what kind of better you are. Most people, uh, casual betters are not betting a thousand dollars per game. They're just getting a couple bucks down. So, you know, they may, they may look at, at a run line and say, oh, man, I don't want to lay the minus 250 with the Dodgers today, but I'll, I'll, I'll take a minus, well, you know, 130 on the run line, and hopefully they win by two. I think that all depends on, on like I said, the threshold, how much you're willing to lay and risk. Uh, if you're willing to lay the minus 250 and you bet big enough to kind of make it worth your while, um, then, you know, that's your, that's your prerogative. But uh, it definitely is an option when – you hit that tipping point. You're like, there's no way I'm, I'm laying, you know, a, a three to one chalk here for, for a money line. Find me something else. I want to have action on this game, but I want to find something. So when looking at favorites versus dogs, so let's keep with this sort of analogy. So Kershaw's pitching or Garrett Cole or Justin Verlander, and we're looking at minus 200, but how can we as the betters really differentiate between minus 180 and minus 230? Because at the end of the day, a lot of us look at it and we're like, all right, here's an elite pitcher who's starting and we're, we're laying a lot for this. But the quantification of really that 50 cents one way or another, the 30 cents, how can we best quantify that so we can understand um, what we're actually giving up or paying other than just straight, the, the just straight denomination of it? Yeah, I mean, pitchers generally are, they make up the bulk of the money line. You know, when odds makers are adding all the ingredients to their money line odds, the starting pitchers take up a huge amount of that. But things like, you know, lineups, um, you know, the success of those lineups, how the hitters maybe one through one through four, one through five are doing at that current time. Um, then you look at bullpens too. And that's another thing that you can have a, a, you can have a sterling starting pitcher that warrants a high price tag. And then, you know, if he has a shaky bullpen behind him, you know, come come the seventh, eighth, ninth inning, that's when you're starting to pull out your hair because those bullpens can can let you down as well too. So those things are also thrown into it. Um, like I said, it all I, I'll, a lot of the money line betting for me at least comes down to kind of how much you're willing to risk, how much you're willing to pay, and then also to how much you you, you want to make or how much you, you're looking at getting back. If you're only betting ten bucks a game, then sometimes you know laying those big money line favorites is just not worth it. You know, you're looking at cents on the dollar when it comes to comparing a minus 180 to, to a minus 200. Uh, so, it, it, like I said, it all varies per the better, but um, at least with starting pitchers, I mean, it, the, you, that's where it ends and begins with, with MLB odds making.
All right. In terms of good starting picture, shaky bullpen. That would next say, <laughs> all right, let's look at the first five inning line. And will this be a bet that is more attractive this season? Because early on there is suggestions that, hey, starting pitchers aren't going to be going as deep. We've got a little bit more of expanded rosters. So there's going to be deeper bullpens. So there's going to be a, a lot more pitch caps for these pitchers. So you would say, all right, well, maybe let me get in on the first five inning line instead of the entire game line. And I believe, too, uh, isn't there a rule where pitchers, relief pitchers, have to go a certain amount of time? Yes, yeah, well? so they, they, can't come in, they can't come in for just one batter unless it is at the end of an inning where they'll cap it. It's like that's third out for the inning. So they have to go three before they can't just start changing back and forth. Yeah, so maybe that's something – I mean, I love first five inning odds because, uh, one, I'm a busy dude on top of all the work I got to do. I got family and stuff, and, and baseball games can stretch out quite long. So first five innings are great. First five innings, I can get in. I can watch the ball game. My bet's up. My bet's over. Win or lose, uh, it was a fun ride for five innings. Uh, but there's, there's, you know, in those particular situations where you have a shaky bullpen and you're, that's the one thing that's, that's, that's pulling you back, you can dive into those first five, first five inning odds there is a little extra tax when it comes to this first five inning odds because it is solely based on the starter and it doesn't have some of those other factors uh, laid into it. So less kind of less variables can come in and impact through five, through those first five innings. Uh, but like first five innings totals are fantastic. Uh, we actually have a, a Jacob deGrom gong in the covers office that we wong every time we win a, a under first five innings back when deGrom's on there. And we had the Bieber fever as well, too. So uh, Bieber there was, was a fantastic first five innings under. You have two great starting pitchers. Um, and if you can match that with two offenses that are a little bit uh, flailing, then, you know, those opportunities are there for those first five inning totals. It seems like we've talked a lot about why we should be betting favorites with this. But if there's anything I know about sports betting, we <laughs> traditionally do not get rich by only betting the favorites. So let's go on the flip side and say, let's look at the dogs. What should we be looking for out of underdogs? Because when we're getting plus money, we don't have to win or lose at a one-to-one -one ratio. Oftentimes, uh, we could lose 60% of the time, or maybe it's 55% of the time, but depending on what the money line might be on some of those dogs. So what do you look for or evaluate when looking at a dog? Yeah, well, again, you're jumping right back into starting pitching. Um, and rather than looking at a pitcher and looking at his season record, uh, I love to go in, look at those last three, last five games, take a closer look at his recent form, how he performed in that. Uh, were they on the road? Were they, um, you know, were they at home? Um, were they playing a very solid lineup the last time? You know, just trying to find any, any angle where maybe an undervalued starting pitcher uh, is, is giving good plus money return. Um, there's a lot of odds, a lot of handicappers out there that they really hard cap themselves. They won't go, they kind of set a, a, a tipping point when it comes to money lines and uh, they won't go too high. And they try to, they try to play those short dogs, whether it's short home dogs. Uh, those, the, the, I got a few capper buddies that just love trying to find opportunities with short home underdogs. Um, and then again, leveraging those, those, those underrated pitchers that may be performing uh, better over their last three or four games than their overall record would, would showcase. One of the things that I think is going to be a narrative to follow this year is home versus away. And is there more value one way or another? Because I think traditionally Joe Public loves to bet favorites and or at home. But now how much does the lack of a crowd affect uh, the performance of something and is there potential value for us one way or another because I would like to think that uh, away teams would have a little bit more value but maybe that changes this year yeah and I, I, I think so I don't think the crowd's going to have too much of an impact um, when it comes to home field advantage outside of maybe looking at like wind and Wrigley and, and those certain ballpark factors that may lend to a particular matchup um, uh, I don't think home home field advantage in baseball has much. I mean, you, you get some travel woes and teams worn down if they're on the road a lot and they're looking to get back home. But one thing I'm I'm looking at this year is that uh, basically how these how these teams travel and then what is their routine when they're on the road? Are they basically ballpark hotel 
and that is it because that's not the normal cadence for baseball players over the course of a summer season. They're going out to the bars and they're going out and doing these, these, these fun things. Perhaps road teams, maybe the focus is a little high. Maybe you're not going to see guys a little tired from being out the night before, you know, if they can, and, ho and hopefully the players buy into that too. I mean, they're, they're grown men, they can make their own decisions, but hopefully they kind of buy into that. So we do get a season where we're not having these, these uh, flare ups and COVID-19 infections basically decimate an entire team because one guy went to a bar or a strip club or something like that. But I've got to think there's probably an angle there when it comes to road teams being very, very regiment, playing their games, going to the hotel, eating their meals in their rooms, doing their walkthroughs and their workouts, and then going back to the field. I don't think the extracurricular activities are going to impact performance as much. So uh, maybe, maybe road teams is where it's at. All right. So another thing to look at would be divisional dogs so we're now going to be playing some of these teams are going to be playing a lot of the same teams over and over again so in this shortened 60 game season you're playing a lot in your same division so mm -hmm. now we've got an element of familiarity so because of that there may be a greater opportunity for these underdogs who are slightly more familiar with these teams to potentially present a little bit more value than a team you see once a year and they just come and they steamroll you yeah, I think, I think that's a kind of a double-edged sword because you're going to get a, a better and more reliable data set for those games because there is that consistency factor. These teams have played each other. They've played in this setup. This pitcher has faced this team this many times. Um, but again, the odds makers have all those numbers and we have all those numbers too. So uh, like I said, a double-edged sword. I think that consistency is going to breed uh, a bit of competitiveness there. Uh, really what you want to see in those matchups that are constantly happening, those divisional matchups that are over, happening over and over is maybe try to spot those anomalies where the value might pop up, you know, is a, is a player out of the lineup that was in the lineup the last few times. And where was that player? Was it a leadoff hitter? Did he set the table really, really well in the last four, you know, in the last couple of matchups, was he very good at, at getting on base or drawing walks or whatever it was. And with him out of the lineup now, how does that change the dynamic of the offense? So, I think within those consistent situations, you got to have a really sharp eye for the anomalies and then spotting that value and, and trying to take advantage of that because the data set is going to be um, a lot more a lot more condensed and I think a lot more reliable. But like I said, it's it's working on either side of the counter. The bookies have it, and we have it. So um, you know, it's it's trying to find those angles where you can get one past them. Is there an 80-20 rule for baseball? So traditionally when betting football, I've talked about this often, where if 80% of the action is on one side, we want to be on the other side because Las Vegas has gigantic casinos for a reason. Yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't think it really applies for baseball because those money lines are so much, so they're, they're based on that, uh, you know, implied probability of winning. And they're, you know, they're skewed to that and they'll move them to that. It's not like betting point spreads where the point spread is supposed to even the playing field. You know what I mean? Um, you know, so if a team is, is eight points better than them, you know, a, a, a seven and a half, are you betting, you know, the, the underdog to cover or the favorite to cover with baseball, with, with money lines generally, which is the you know, most common way that people wager on baseball, um, you don't really get that. You get to see how greater one team is than the other. Let's look at live betting for a second because it's something that over the last year is probably the thing that I've been most excited about all throughout the football season. I was doing a ton of live betting and really tracking the markets to see when opportunities present themselves. So now yeah. let's look at this on the baseball side of things and what do we need to be cognizant of when live betting? I mean, because you've given some great examples of the Bieber or the Jacob deGrom unders on the first five innings and if if I was going to be watching that same game and looking at the live betting lines, mm -hmm. where would the opportunities present itself or how should we be thinking about live betting in baseball? Yeah. Base, baseball is a bit of a, is a, is a little bit of a tough live betting market to get the best of because it doesn't have that fluidity like you would see with say basketball or hockey or even, even football in a way too. Um, you know, if, if a runner gets on base, if a runner advances to second, the action is stopped. The odds are then closed and then post it back up. So there's no kind of, if you're watching the game, you don't get that feel or that swing in momentum necessarily. Um, now, playoff baseball is usually, that's my favorite time to bet live baseball because you do see like that late inning action. You see 
you know, run scored in the seventh and eighth and those, those tense moments later on. And I think with this condensed schedule towards the end of the year, we're going to see some of those. I think some of these regular season games are really going to take on a playoff type feel and then teams are going to treat them as such. It's not going to be, you know, there's not going to be this, oh, we'll ease into the schedule. There's a bit more urgency there. So I think, I think we'll see teams pressing a little more in the later innings when they're down because they know they can't afford uh, to fall to fall back in the standings because they just don't have the, the schedule to make it up. Um, so I think there could be opportunities there late, uh, especially in those, those close division races where teams are hunting for playoff spots. Um, but then too, I think when you're watching baseball, maybe some of, some of the things, some of the tips that you can, or some of the things to look for when you're watching a game, I think it's very, there's guys that will jump into live betting without watching a game just because maybe they're trying to, you know, hedge something or maybe it's a, an arbitrage opportunity that they're trying to, to, to swing in the, in the, the odds. But, um, you know, watch the pitchers. Watch the pitchers. Did he, did he throw a wild pitch? Um, does he just seem a little rattled? Has the catcher had to come out and talk to him a couple times? Uh, warning track shots. Has he allowed a couple shots to the warning track that, you know, in the, in the, in the scorecard, they look, you know, that's just an out to the center fielder, out to the left fielder. But if you can, if you can see it, those, those pitchers get a little rattled, maybe have a couple close calls, you know, then you can say, ah, there's something wrong with this guy. And maybe that's when you want to jump on the over or jump on the other side. If, if you notice that, you know, a pitcher just doesn't seem right. Are there any final tips or tricks or things that we should be looking out for when betting this MLB season? Um, one thing with baseball betting and, and is different from uh, other betting, specifically like football and basketball and things like that. You know, I always say be wary of trends. You know, you always want trends with teeth. You always want trends that, that have a bit of a narrative behind them. You know, they've done, they've gone under in their, you know, last, you know, seven of their last 10 first quarters. Okay. Well, why is that? And then you, you dig into that and you find out why with baseball, I tend to lean on trends a little more because there is a consistency to the schedule um, because teams are playing opponents like three days in a row. And as you mentioned with divisional foes, there's a, there's a, a lot more reliable data set there. So I find, I find when trends happen in baseball, I'm more likely to jump on them and bet them um, than I would any other sport, just because there, like I said, there is a bit of a consistency to, to, to baseball that's there that isn't in any of the other sports. Jason, really excited about this upcoming MLB season because we have sports. <laughs> Hallelujah. Fingers Where, crossed. Don't jinx us yet. Where can everybody connect with you? Uh, well, you can come to covers.com and check out all the awesome baseball coverage we've got going right now. And then it'll be basketball coverage and hockey coverage. And then, you know, Lord willing, we'll get some football in there as well, too. Uh, but you can follow me on Twitter at Covers JLo. Uh, digging into uh, digging into the opening day games now. I've got uh, my preview for the Giants and Dodgers up there. I think if you want a little tidbit, I think that Buster Posey sitting out is going to definitely impact the pitching staff, especially early on here as we get some inconsistent results. He's usually a steadying force, but he's not going to be behind home plate for them. They're kind of scrambling. Uh, and then right now, I'm um, digging into the Yankees and Nats, which is going to be a fun game. Uh, I know Scherzer got roughed up there in his last outing. His, uh, his warm-up outing. So, and, and the Yankees, if anyone benefits from the schedule being uh, yanked around by COVID-19, it's the Yankees because they get all those big bats back that they were expected to be missing at the beginning of April. So uh, really, really anxious to see how the Yankees are swinging the big sticks here at the promote uh, against Max Scherzer. And I want to hear from you. I want you to send me your first MLB bet that you make this season. Let me know what it is. You can hit me up on Twitter at Rob Cressy. Make sure to use hashtag sharp 600 and be part of our community. And also make sure to tag at covers. And I want to give a shout out to all of you who have listened throughout the entire last year. Uh, it's been great having you part of this community. One thing that you can do that can really help us out is if you dig this show, go on iTunes, give us a rating and review because when you do, it really helps with discovery. And you know what? When you do, I will give you a shout out on the next show. And remember, you want to be a sharp, don't be a square with your bankroll, be disciplined with your money management. <laughs>